Let's bow our heads for a moment before we open God's word. Dear Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. We all know that people come in assorted shapes, sizes, and colors. And yet the truth of it is that every person, young or old, rich or poor, they're all looking for the same thing, happiness. That's what we're all seeking. Different of us look in very different places. Some people look to sensory pleasures, to food and drink, maybe to alcohol and drugs. I've known through the years some who would think that going on a shopping spree is a way to be happy, or maybe winning the lottery. I think it's been a few years ago now, I remember it was in January, but at the time, and it's probably been exceeded since then, but it had the largest Powerball drawing in the history of our country, $1.6 billion was awarded to the winner of the lottery. And there was so much excitement across the country. You know, am I going to be the one to get $1.6 billion? Just to put that in perspective, that's 16 tons of $100 bills. It's hard for us to even imagine. Just in Pennsylvania, I saw a story that just in Pennsylvania alone, 20,000 Powerball tickets per minute were sold the day before the drawing. Millions of people playing in the hope of finding happiness. If I were to win that, I would be happy. When I was working, there were times I felt the epitome of happiness would be to hit the snooze button when the alarm went off <laughs> and just ignore it and snooze the whole day away, especially the last couple of years because I was having to get up at 2 in the morning and do that without feeling guilty for doing it. But happiness is not easy to find. There seems to be so little happiness and such an overabundance of unhappiness in our world. Unhappiness is so terribly hard to be rid of. I once read a story about a constable in Ontario, Canada. The constable was at his desk one day and the telephone rang and the lady on the other end was just frantic. Oh, she said, I need help. I have a skunk in my basement. What am I going to do? Okay, I'll tell you what you do. Do you have some bread in the house? Yes. Well, go out to the window to where he got in and leave a trail of bread, crumbs from the basement out the window into the yard. Oh, thank you, officer. Thank you so much. What a great idea. And he sat back feeling quite proud of himself that he had had the wisdom of a Solomon. <laughs> and it wasn't much later that the telephone rang again. The same lady, twice as frantic this time. Why, he said, whatever went wrong. Did you do what I said? Oh, yes. I laid a trail of breadcrumbs from the basement out into the yard. Well, what happened? Now I have two skunks in my basement. And this is the way it is with unhappiness. The harder you work at trying to be rid of it, sometimes the more of it you have. Years ago, we lived in Texas, and we had a collection of lizards. 
probably a dozen or so different varieties from different parts of the world. And they weren't particularly difficult to take care of, but they did have one problem that we had to address. So they needed live food. Even during the winter when, you know, it's hard to find bugs and things to feed them. And so we found ourselves raising crickets at a large cardboard box. The only problem was sometimes a cricket or several would get out of the box and be loose in the house. And that really didn't bother us a whole lot until it got to be dark and it was time to go to sleep. <laughs> and then invariably we would be serenaded by a very loud cricket chirping. And Sandy would prod me out of bed to play Orkin Man to try to get rid of the pests. You could tell about where they were. I mean, it's kind of in this part of the house. But to try to identify exactly where that sound is coming from with a cricket, almost impossible. I know it's there, but I can't find it. And I'm not that happy that he should make our home his home. But how can I get rid of him if I can't even find him? If we can't find what it is that is making us unhappy, how are we going to get rid of it? We've got to know what it is that makes us unhappy and what it is that brings us happiness. Our lesson today, happiness is found not by looking for it, but by looking to Christ. Young people, the harder you work to find happiness, the less likely you are to find it. See if you can take this thought home with you today, our theme today. I looked to Jesus, and the dove of peace flew to my side. I reached out for the dove, and the dove flew away. You see, when we look to Christ, happiness comes. But when we reach out for happiness, somehow it seems to disappear. We find happiness not by seeking it, but by seeking Christ. We must be surprised by joy. We feel that from doing certain things and following certain techniques that happiness is guaranteed in our lives, but it doesn't seem to work. You've got to be surprised by joy. Once upon a time, there was a man who did an exhaustive, lifelong research on what it takes to make a person happy. Solomon was in a most perfect position to do the research. First of all, he was a king, and he had all the power a man could have. And he could, could get anybody to do anything and everything for him. He was the wisest man, the smartest man that ever lived. Talking about trusting someone's intelligence in doing research, this was Solomon's strength. And he had all of the money necessary to do all the looking that he wanted. His kingdom was at peace. And so he had all the time in the world. And he was young and full of energy. And so he set out to find the source of happiness. The result of his lifelong search is the book of Ecclesiastes. I invite you to find a Bible today and open to the book of Ecclesiastes. Remember how important it is to learn from the past. Human nature does not change. The challenges and the temptations and the ideas as to where happiness might be found today were there also in Solomon's day. Time has not changed man that much. And that's one of the things that Solomon is telling us in the book of Ecclesiastes. We'll start with the first chapter. Ecclesiastes, the first chapter, and verses 9 and 10. Ecclesiastes 1, 9 and 10. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. 
And that which is done is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? No, it hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no new thing, Solomon says. Every thought, every problem that you will ever face has already been faced by someone. Solomon looked for happiness in all of the places that you are tempted to look. Those who cannot learn from the mistakes of the past are doomed to repeat those mistakes. And so today, I invite you to trust this wise man, his words that we're going to look at today, to do our research for us. Let us take advantage of the lessons that he learned throughout his life and wrote down for our benefit. Solomon says that happiness is not found by seeking it. I'd like us to look briefly at four places where Solomon looked for happiness. First of all, he looked at entertainment. Solomon learned that entertainment won't bring happiness. Ecclesiastes, the second chapter, and the first three verses. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. I said in mine heart, go to now. Probably today we would say, go for it. Be all in. Go to now. I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly till I might see what was that good for the sons of men which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. He tried, he says, drinking. He got into wine. He tried drowning his problems with alcohol, and he found that he only gave them swimming lessons and they came back stronger than ever before. Verse 8, the last part of verse 8 in chapter 2. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. To make it contemporary, I suppose that Solomon had his own rock group, his own band. He tried sex. Solomon, 1 Kings 11 tells us, had 700 wives and 300 concubines. It's not the easiest living with one. I've done that for about 48 years now. <laughs> Trust me. A thousand significant others. Could you imagine? How significant are you if you're one of a thousand? If he were to spend one minute each day with each of his wives and concubines, it would take 16 hours to spend one quality minute with each of his wives and concubines. Could you imagine? Just think of the time it took just to kiss them each good night. 1,000. And what was the result of all of this research into finding happiness and pleasure and entertainment? Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter, and the sixth verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 6. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Did you ever try to build a bonfire out of weeds, out of thorns, maybe dry tumbleweeds that we find all over the, de the desert? That's what Solomon is talking about here. They'll burn. They'll burn brightly. They'll burn beautifully. They may burn very noisily, but they don't last very long. We've had a pretty nice week this last week. We've had some beautiful winter weather. But the week or two before that, we had some really cold weather. And my grandkids were with me on a couple of weekends in a row when it was really cold. And I have a fire pit I hadn't used in a while. And they said, Grandpa, let's get the fire pit out. So we got it out. And we had a little trouble getting the fire started. 
But then all through, as I've got a couple dozen pine trees on my property, there's all these pine needles all over the ground near the fire pit. And we just took handfuls of those and stuck them on the fire where there were just a few flames. And I mean, in just a matter of a few seconds, whoosh, it would just burn as if you poured gasoline on the fire almost. And they burned brightly, they burned hot, they burned brilliantly. It was a beautiful thing to see. And we all had to back away from the fire because it was so hot. And about two minutes later, all of those had burned up already. It's what Solomon is talking about here, about pleasure. Well, of course, there's some excitement. Of course, there's some heat. Of course, there's some noise. But there's nothing lasting there. I remember us going to watch the fireworks on the 4th of July. You know, those fireworks would be shot up and there would be a great burst or maybe several bursts going on at the same time. And then as they fell down through the atmosphere, sometimes they would burst again into all the colors of the rainbow. And then the fireworks would go out and everything was dark. But as I kept looking up at the sky, I noticed that it wasn't entirely dark. There were stars there all the time. And every time the other fireworks went out, I would look and the stars were still there. They never one of them went out or fell down. This is the way Solomon says it is with pleasure. Oh, it's a great bang. It's a great sparkle. It's great fun for a moment. And then nothing. With Christ, we have something that is permanent. In Christ, there is stability. There is security. That's why we find happiness not by seeking it, but by seeking Christ. Secondly, You would expect Solomon to look at learning. He was famous for his wisdom, for his learning, for his knowledge. And Solomon found that knowledge does not bring happiness. Ecclesiastes, the first chapter, verse 16 and the first part of 17. Ecclesiastes 1, 16, the first part of 17. I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate. And have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom. And to know madness and folly. Such a wise man. And the result. The end of verse 17 and then verse 18. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom there is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Now Ecclesiastes, the second chapter, verses 14 and 15. Ecclesiastes 2, 14 and 15. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity. What Solomon is saying is that when he looks down at the corpse of a moron, of a fool, he realizes that that moron has just as much, just as high an IQ as Solomon will have when he lies in his casket. Verse 16. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man? As the fool. Whatever philosophy, my friend, you choose as yours, if it doesn't solve the problem of death, it is a dead-end philosophy. And so Solomon decided that knowledge and wisdom would not work to bring happiness. Thirdly, 
How about work? Would that bring happiness? Solomon discovered that work does bring a measure of satisfaction, but it does not bring happiness. Some of us have lived long lives and haven't found that out yet. Ecclesiastes, the second chapter, verses 4 to 6. Ecclesiastes 2, beginning with verse 4. I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. And I planted trees and them of all kinds. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. Now that really speaks to me because that's my favorite thing to do is to go out and plant trees and plants and to get them watered because I find that they really give back. In my garden, I planted most of my trees, you know, almost 35 years ago. That's how long I've lived on the same property. Now the trees have all grown and they give me shade, they cool the area down, they give me fruit, they give me color. Solomon tried work, accomplishment, creating things. Now most of us look to work as a virtue. There's a little something peculiar that goes on in our psyche, and it's something like this. If work is good, then more work, overwork, is better. And so the harder I work, the more virtuous I am. I doubt that anyone would really argue that openly, and yet subconsciously, every workaholic tends to believe it. Now, in my pr prime years of my life, I would work typically at my job 50 to 60 hours a week, usually six days a week. Anywhere from eight to 10 hours a day. And the only reason I didn't work more than 60 is because they put a cutoff at 60 hours because then they had to pay me double time at that point. And so I would work and I had the early schedule. I would get off usually by two o'clock in the afternoon. Then I would go home and I'd work in my garden. I had a lot of nice daylight time left. And I would work my tail off in the garden. And sometimes if I had projects I really wanted to get done, I had these portable lights and I would bring them out and shine them and I would keep working after dark. And I had seven children to help take care of. Always staying so very busy and at the end of the day, I would feel a certain sense of accomplishment, as I'm sure Solomon felt. But then I would realize that I had done everything but spend time with the good Lord. I had allowed things work, virtuous things, to get in the way of my relationship with God. Ecclesiastes 2, verses 10 and 11 and whatsoever mine eyes desired I kept not from them I withheld not my heart for many joy for my heart rejoiced in all my labor and this was my portion of all my labor then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do and behold all was vanity and vexation of spirit and there was no profit under the sun this is also true of schoolwork. Who ever heard of a student who would stay up all night working on a term paper that maybe he procrastinated on all semester without bragging about it? There's hardly anything in your school experience that makes you more proud than to give all night long to learning. But listen, young person, when your school program crowds out your devotion time, Work has become the devil's tool. Could there be anything that would make the devil so happy as to get Christian young people in a Christian school so busy studying their Christian work and doing their Christian works that they don't have any time for Christ? We find happiness not by seeking it, but by seeking Christ. The fourth place that I would suggest that Solomon looked for happiness was money. 
And Solomon learned that no matter how much of it he had, money could not make him happy. I talked about the lottery earlier. I think I read a statistic the other day that those who win at least a million dollars in a lottery, like at least half of them declare bankruptcy within five years. It doesn't bring happiness. Ecclesiastes, the second chapter, verses 7 and 8. I got me servants and mad servants. I had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. And the result is found in Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter and the tenth verse. You know, some historians say that silver during Solomon's reign was as common in Jerusalem as the stones. And there are a lot of stones in that area. What did he learn? Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 10. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. A man by the name of Dr. Horton, Dr. R.F. Horton, he was a minister. He was a member of the London Missionary Society, and they would send out missionaries from England into all the world to evangelize it. But his particular ministry, his parish was a part of London, and he spent his life ministering to some of the wealthiest people in the entire city. And at the close of his ministry, he made this statement, quote, The greatest lesson life has taught me is that people who set their mind and heart on riches are equally disappointed whether they get them or whether they do not get them. That's kind of a profound statement. The greatest lesson life has taught me, people who set their mind on heart and heart on riches are equally disappointed whether they get them or whether they do not get them. Whether you win the lottery or you don't, you're still going to be unhappy if that's how you're looking for happiness. And that's what Solomon learned. Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter, verses 11 and 12. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saying the beholding of them with their eyes? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much. But the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. You see, the more money, the more you worry. And anybody that loves money enough to gather a lot of it together is going to be the person most worried about losing that which they loved so much. How many of you laid awake last night worrying about the stock market or what was going to happen in real estate or whether your treasure was secure? If you're like me, you didn't at all because you don't have any. <laughs> And so you don't have to worry. And Solomon says that's the blessing of not having much. And so if you just put down your last dollar in the offering plate today, maybe you would be the most happiest person in church. Ecclesiastes, the second chapter and the 11th verse summarizes Solomon's research. Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and all the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. He tried entertainment. He tried learning. He tried work. He tried money. And he says that it's not to be found there. How many young people there are who feel, if I were just done with school, 
then I'd be happy. If I just got married and maybe started a family, then I'd be happy. If I just had a brand new car, I would be happy. If I just got a nice big house to live in, if I just had a good paying job, then I would be happy. But 10, 20, 30 years later, the people out there who once said that very same thing are telling you, you know, the happiest years of my life was when I was in school, when I was young, when I was just starting out, when I didn't have so much to worry about. What we are learning from Solomon is that it is folly to think that anything brings happiness. Happiness is not found in doing the things we like to do, but learning to like the things that we ought to do. There is the secret of happiness. Happiness then does not depend upon your circumstances. It depends upon your state of mind. And only the Lord Jesus Christ can give you the positive thinking, can give you the love-centered thinking that can make you happy no matter your circumstance. That's why we find happiness not by looking for it, but by looking to Christ. Happiness is found by seeking Christ. Ecclesiastes, the second chapter and the 26th verse, the first part of verse 26. For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. Would it be fair if we just abbreviated that even a bit more? For God giveth to a man joy. Where does it come from? Remember the old hymn, if you want joy... Real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. Rudyard Kipling, the great poet, was lying desperately ill of typhoid fever. Science, medicine had done everything that could be done for him. He had nurses attending to him around the clock. And early one morning, just as the sun was rising, he stirred and he was restless in his bed and he was trying to say something. And the nurse bent over and she said, Mr. Kipling, what do you want? And then the great poet answered, I want God. Because God is the final answer to every want and every need of life. And I can picture Solomon with all that he went through and all the brilliance of his reign and all that he went through to try to find happiness. I could see at the very end as he's ready to die, I could see him saying the same words. King Solomon, what do you want most? And he boiled it down. I want God. That's the secret to happiness. God is the final answer to every want and need of life. Oh, I suppose we all want God. That's why we're here in church today, isn't it? But Solomon will not let us be content there because only when we give Christ our whole person can we be whole persons. Have you given him your whole person? Here's Solomon's analogy in Ecclesiastes, the 10th chapter and the first verse. Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 1. See if you can catch his analogy here. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 1. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. Talking about a perfume maker. And as he's making his perfume, a few dead flies get into the perfume and they make the whole batch stink. Just a few dead flies. Doesn't take much. Just a few dead flies. To put it in modern terminology, what he's saying is that partial commitment stinks. 
a part belonging to God and a part belonging to the world. Part perfume, part dead flies. You can't make anything smell sweet that way. Partial commitment stinks. Only when we give all there is of us, the whole person, do we become whole. And so we think of Solomon as being a wise man. I'm not so sure that in one sense Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. I guess maybe he was the smartest. But really, as you look at his story, he sure was one of the biggest fools. As a young man, Solomon had hold of the same beautiful, bright promise of our young men and women in our congregation today and in our church. He had all the brain power to go with it, but he squandered his life away before he finally learned that we find happiness not by seeking for it, but by seeking for God. And the man who has to squander his life before he finds that out is not a wise man at all. If we just had one generation of young people who could study lives like Solomon's experience and take Solomon at his word and accept by faith that all of these things that tempt all of us cannot bring us the happiness for which we seek. If we could only begin where Solomon ended his life, such a generation of young people would finish the gospel in all the world. Solomon learned it. He learned it after his life was already wasted. He learned it after his kingdom was lost. And then he said, I must sit down. And he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes so that you could learn it before you waste your life. Christ is the key to fullness of joy. For years, I would carry on my key ring two very similar keys. One was for my home church in Sierra Vista. And with that key, I could get into the front door of the church. That's the only place I could go. But if I was working on the landscaping, which I did occasionally, and I needed to use the restroom, I could get in there to do that. Or if I needed something else, I could get into the church. But it was very limiting because I, what I did not have was a key that opened the little lockbox inside the church that had all these keys lined up in it that would go to every room and every thing that needed unlocking, every cabinet. That's the key I really needed. But at least I could get in through one door. Very similar key to that was a key I had when I worked at the post office for 33 years. I was a trusted member of the staff there and I was the first one to get there every morning to welcome the truck when it came with the mail and the packages and everything. And so I would go and unlock the gate that surrounded the post office and then that same key would get me in to the door to get in the building. And the same key would unlock the doors that were chained shut, the swinging doors that would allow us to bring the mail in and out and all the carts. And I could get in to just about every single room inside that post office because what I had was the master key. I guess they trusted me a little more there than they did at the church. <laughs> And any time somebody wanted something, needed to get into a room at the post office, they would come to me, Steve, do you have a key? Can you? Yes, I've got a master key. I can get you in that room. Couldn't get into the postmaster's office and a few other places, but every other place I had access to because I had a master key. Young people, there are many philosophies of life that will open at least one door. You can find some fulfillment and some contentment and some degree of happiness opening just one door. But sometimes it becomes very frustrating. The only key that will unlock all the doors is the master's key. 
Won't you take the key that gives you full freedom, that will let you into all of the joy and all of the happiness and all of the opportunity that your heart craves. Christ is the master key to fullness of joy. I looked to Christ and the dove of peace flew to my side. I reached out for the dove and the dove flew away. We find happiness not by seeking it, but by seeking Christ. My prayer today is each one of you, individually as families, as a church family, will not seek happiness, but will seek Christ.